With over 50 departments and divisions, the largest police force and school district on Cape Cod, and home to the only regional airport, the town of Barnstable is a hub of activity every day. A new monthly show to keep our residents, businesses, and visitors informed. From workshops and meetings, new regulations and ordinances, elections and special events, we will help keep you plugged into Municipal Matters. Today, we explore the importance of the 2020 Census and how you can help Cape Cod get a complete count. This year, we're conducting the U.S. Census. It's a once-in-a-decade opportunity to be counted and have your voice heard. And being counted is so important because it determines issues such as political representation and how many seats Massachusetts will have in the federal government. Even more important, it affects the federal funding that will be given to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts over the next 10 years. The school funding, including funding for school lunches that southeastern Massachusetts has received since 2011. That's because everyone was counted. Housing, education, and employment opportunities for our veterans. That was because everyone was counted. Community grants and resources, local transportation and infrastructure initiatives, and even decisions made by businesses about where to expand operations. That's because everyone was counted. For those of you worried about filling out this form, I want to assure you that it's safe and it's confidential. So please, fill out your census form because Massachusetts is entitled to receive the proper amount of funding to support its citizens. If you have any questions on the census or filling out the form, please contact one of my offices. Remember, everyone should be counted. Everyone deserves to be counted. Fact-finding is one of America's oldest activities. In the early 1600s, a census was taken in Virginia and people were counted in nearly all of the British colonies that became the United States at the time of the Revolutionary War. Following independence, there was an almost immediate need for a census of the entire nation, and it was written into the Constitution. Both the number of seats each state was to have in the U.S. House of Representatives and the state's respective shares in paying for the war were to be based on population. Shortly after George Washington became president, the first census was taken in 1790. The 1790 census counted 3.9 million inhabitants, a number which some people thought low, and raised membership in the U.S. House of Representatives from an original 65 to 105. Ever since 1790, the population census statistics have been the official figures used every 10 years to compute the number of congressional representatives allowed each state and also in conformity with the Supreme Court's 1965 one man, one vote ruling to align congressional district boundaries so that each member of Congress represents approximately the same number of people. For the same reason, the census figures are used in redistricting state legislatures and other local governing bodies. In recent years, many federal, state, and local government plans, grants and aid, and revenue sharing programs have been based by law on factors calculated from census statistics for population. Likewise, census data for all types, population, housing, and all of the economic subjects, including transportation, are crucial for market analysis, for planning new services and facilities, for affirmative action programs, for studying environmental impact, and for basic research in many academic fields. In 2020, it is even more important now than it was in 1790 that every person be counted and that the information about each be accurate and complete. Today, we will show you how a Cape Cod complete count will affect you and our community. How does the census affect us here in the town of Barnstable and our region? That getting a complete count of children in the 2020 census is important for school funding? We talked to Barnstable Public School Superintendent Meg Mayo-Brown on the importance of counting every child in Barnstable.
So for the school system, we receive what we refer to as entitlement grants. And they're entitlement grants because they supplement or we're entitled to them based on our student population. Um, in addition to our operating budget, we have um, a number of grants that supplement that operating budget that are targeted toward uh, students that may have additional needs beyond sort of typical or traditional needs. So for example, we receive uh, a good amount from a, what's re what we refer to as a Title I grant. And that grant is intended to support um, students who may be considered economically disadvantaged, um, coming from homes of low income or poverty. And we know students that, um, that, that come from those households often need an additional safety net, need an additional um, need additional instruction. And so the Title I grant provides us additional funding in order to hire more teachers or paraprofessionals, math specialists, and the like to be able to support the learning um, from students who are coming from low-income households. So that's one example of an entitlement grant. We have a Title II grant, a Title III grant. Our Title III grant is critically important because it provides additional resources for students who are English language learners. So an accurate census count ensures that we receive the funding that's necessary in order to serve the, um, the students in Barnstable. So Enoch Cobb Early Learning Center is our program that serves students who uh, have disabilities as well as students without disabilities beginning at age three. So again, that type of program um, serves students with very diverse and unique needs, w requires additional supplemental funding beyond what the town of Barnstable can provide through our operating budget. So. Again, the census gives us an opportunity to have all kids counted in a way that we know what their needs are and how we can have additional funding to support those needs. You know, again, I think much of the census is providing us additional information to supplement what we're already doing. So if we don't have a clear sense of what our student need is, we, we're sort of missing the mark on supplementing or really targeting our services toward a particular need. And we, we don't want to do that. We want to be sure that we're very precise in knowing who our students are, the types of needs that they have, um, both educationally and wraparound, um, and being able to meet those needs. So I can't emphasize enough that the census is a way, yet another way that we can identify the students that we're working with. I think that that is a community-wide effort um, to get that message out to all families. I know as a school system we are communicating both in Portuguese and Spanish um, with our families at the school level. It's not something that's coming out of my office, but for the relationships that have been built between teachers, principals, and families to encourage at the school level that it's necessary important to respond to the uh, census and it's safe that the the data that's collected through the census is confidential and private and cannot be used in any other manner other than to know the number of students and families we have in the town We have approximately, give or take, 5,000 students enrolled in Barnesville Public Schools. And I'm just going to look at my notes here, but just because our most recent data that we submitted to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is that over 1,800 of our students are considered economically disadvantaged. I can tell you that number is probably lower than what it actually is uh, because the way that the Department of Education counts students as economically disadvantaged is, is if they are receiving some form of state assistance, SNAP benefits, mass health as an example. Um, we know that we have many students who are not accessing those state services who are not being counted. I think the census is another way that we can really cast a wider net and determine um, who our students are and the level of service uh, that's necessary. So we see an uh, a, a increase in students who are learning English um, for the first time. I've been here for four years in the district, and when I started, that percentage in the district was around 6%. 6% of our overall enrollment were students who were learning English. 
we're now over 12 percent. So just in a short time, the number of students who are learning English has doubled. Um, by all indicators, those rates are not going to slow down. We're going to continue to welcome and educate students who are learning English uh, for the first time. That requires an additional level of resource. Uh, we need teachers who are certified as English as a second language teacher. Um, and so again, the Title III grant would supplement our ability to hire teachers and other support personnel who are working with our students who are learning English for the first time. When we plan, we actually look at the birth rate in the town to make a determination in, in terms of what things are going to look like in five or ten years because today's birth rate are our kindergartners in five years. And five years may sound like a long time when you're raising a, <laughs> a child, but really five years is not a long time in terms of planning and, again, needing to know what our enrollment figures are going to look like. There's been a lot of talk that enrollment is declining on the Cape overall for school-age um, students were not particularly seeing that in Barnstable. There was a period of time um, where we lost a lot of students. It sounds like families moved off Cape. Um, but since I've been here, our enrollment has been steady, and not only steady, becoming more and more diverse in terms of the types of um, needs that our students have. Yeah, I would just encourage our families to go ahead and fill it out and know that that information is in the end going to help all of our students um, thrive and be successful in Barnesville Public Schools. What is the 2020 Census? Every 10 years, the Census records everyone living in this country. It's written in the Constitution and comes in a questionnaire that counts everyone who lives at your address on April 1st. The data can be used to inform funding for services like fire stations, schools, clinics, and representation that affect your community. How will 2020 Census data be used? Where there are more people, there are more needs for public services. That's why the Census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. How does the 2020 Census affect representation? There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. These get distributed to the 50 states by population, and an accurate census response helps your state get the right amount of seats. States with smaller populations get at least one while states with larger populations might get more. How do I take the 2020 census? In March 2020, every address in the country will receive an invitation to complete a simple questionnaire. And there are three ways to respond. Number one, do it online. Number two, call by phone. Number three, send it by mail. For those who don't respond, a census taker from your community will follow up and assist you. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. And crossing the age spectrum, we join Elder Services at the Barnstable Adult Community Center to learn more how census numbers impact the elderly in our community with critical nutrition programs. Food is connection, I think, for all of us. When we think about um, food, we think about family meals, whether when we were growing up during our childhood or with our families, you know, you go home after work and you sit together as a family and eat together. Um, and I think sometimes we can take that for granted because for a lot of older people, they're living alone. For them, going out to the store to purchase food, it can be extremely cost prohibitive, um, especially to eat well. You know, you spend a lot of your dollars in the in the produce section. Um, and looking at the congregate meal program and Meals on Wheels, 
you know, the impact that these programs have on people is to ensure that they can maintain adequate nutrition as they age so that they can age successfully. Well, with Barnstable County, we're one of the older counties, especially in our state, but also nationally. Um, so looking at numbers, Barnstable County has 36.3% of its population, which is over the age of 60. Barnstable uh, town proper is 32.1%. So as you see, it's about a third of the population is over the age of 60. It shows that there's a lot of people that are retiring here. Um, and so we, and going to the census, we really need that census population information because that's where we get a lot of our funding for senior programs, in particular Meals on Wheels. Federal funding is always based on population. And so the bigger the population you have, the more federal funding you're going to have. So we're looking at, especially since we're uh, geared towards senior services, we're looking at getting, making sure that the census accurately reflects the population so we get all the dollars that we can to give those that need the services here in Barnstable County. So our senior nutrition program offers two diverse programs, first of all. We're talking about Meals on Wheels, which many people have heard about, but there's also senior dining. And so I'll talk about the senior dining first because that's mostly what a lot of people haven't heard about. So senior dining is where uh, individuals over the age of 60 come to one of our nutrition sites um, and they can get a nutritious meal. Those are for people over the age of 60. A congregate lunch is also a similar meal to what they'll get from a Meals on Wheels. However, this one is a warmed meal that's going to be served, it's going to be plated and served to the individual. So it's kind of like restaurant style but they're also sitting in a community setting. So those individuals can socialize with people that are coming and attending that program. Now, a lot of people have friends there, and so this is a way that they get to go and see their best friends and have a good nutritious meal. So they're getting that socialization. It's, again, helping them with their nutrition. Nutrition is very important, especially for the people of this age, because it's been shown that nutrition actually helps stave off other medical concerns. So um, there's been a, you know, a push for food is medicine, which is a big thing throughout our state and the nation. And it's been shown that Meals on Wheels and Senior Dining have been very important in helping people stay out of hospitalization. With the congregate meal program, the added piece on that is the socialization. Um, you know, that opportunity to connect people that otherwise would be at home alone, receiving a meal on wheel, meals on wheel um, every day, or trying to prepare their own meals, where they're still feeling a sense of isolation because they don't have people to get together with. And that's really, I think, the beauty of the congregate lunch program is that every day we have people that come in here, not just for the meal, but also for the socialization and the connection. Um, and by gathering together their lives, you know, every day they're, they're, there's meaning in their lives. As we age, sometimes we just don't feel as hungry as we used to. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing either because we're not getting the proper nutrition. We may not get the proper uh, caloric intake, the proper vitamins and nutrition that we should be. So our meals will make sure that at least they're getting a third of what is proper in calories as well as uh, you know, vitamins and nutrition. Besides nutrition, when you're talking about the Meals on Wheels program, first of all, it offers independence. A lot of people without these meals may not be at home. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, it's also a safety check. It's a well-being check. Our drivers go out there, they're caring individuals, and they're seeing them day in and day out. So they know when Mrs. Smith may not be doing as well as she had been, and they can report that back to us, and then we can get that person the help that they may need. Um, so there's also a well-being aspect to it. So it's nutrition, it's the socialization that they get from a driver, because sometimes, too, a lot of our elders, especially here on Cape Cod, their children are nowhere around. So they're isolated, especially when you're talking about during the winter. Because a lot of our, a lot of people on Cape Cod are snowbirds and they go to Florida, they go to Arizona or whatever. So a lot of our, our areas are desolate at times. And so without those drivers, they don't talk to anybody, they, nobody's checking on them and they're not getting a meal. Our senior program, especially the nutrition program, is very based on volunteers. We need volunteers. Um, volunteers deliver our meals. So all of our drivers through Barnstable County, Dukes, and Nantucket are all volunteers, um, which is wonderful. It shows how the community values our program and how they're willing to assist one another in our program. Um, also, there at our senior nutrition sites, a lot of our servers are also volunteers as well. Um, so senior dining and nutrition program in general is very based on volunteers. Filling out these census information is extremely important. 
Um, it could be services that could help you. It could be services to help your neighbors or other, your friends in the community. So you're not just helping yourself, but you're helping the community out by reporting what you have. It is kept confidential, but they're only looking at the statistic numbers because the federal government looks at the population at certain aspects, and that's how their dollars are sent, sent out to each region. So that's why it's important for us to get everybody to report because we need every dollar we can get so we can help all those individuals over the age of 60 that need a meal or any other wide variety of services that are needed here on the Cape May Islands. Well, if anybody that volunteers, volunteering is first of all, it's giving to another individual. So it's self-fulfilling, you feel wonderful, you get that wonderful feeling. It's also a way for them to get involved in their community and get to know about their neighbors, their friends, and the town that they're involved in. So there, it's, it's a two-way street. Volunteers help the individuals that they're giving the meals to, but they're also helping themselves as well. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. The complete count for Census 2020 uh, is one of the most important things that a community can do. From the federal right down to the local level, taking the number of people that are here in our communities is really important in so many different ways. So if the federal government bases the monies that they give each state on the numbers of people that you have, because based on the numbers of people it could be more kids in the schools it could be more people who have retired and they need different services it could be the people who are looking to buy houses it's 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 a huge it's it's all across every age of every person that lives here and the big part about this is the state of Massachusetts is looking at $22 billion that could come to us. Just from the, the counting of the census. Exactly. You stated a very large number of $22 billion, but we can break this down into uh, our senior center and money for uh, our community's senior center, mm -hmm. but we can also break it down region-wide as well. Absolutely. D don't forget that all of us have representatives from different areas and the, the complete com count committee for us is by Barnstable County. So what we're looking at at a county level is, gee, how many representatives do we need? How many senators do we need? Will those numbers change? And as those numbers grow or change or decrease, it moves our, it moves our voting lines for right. who we can vote for. Right, and this actually even um, uh, comes right down in granular into the local level of changing precinct lines as well. Absolutely. Did that happen recently in 2013? Actu actually it did. We had to have all 13 town councilors had to be up for an election in, one, in that one year because all of the precinct lines changed. So they moved a little bit and it, uh, that's all it takes but for your town councilor, you want to be able to vote for your town councilor. Right. Federal funding is, is a big piece of the census. Um, uh, school funding, mm -hmm. uh, voting for representatives and region. This whole count, though, a complete count, what does that really mean that you want a complete count? A complete count means all of the people. It doesn't, it, the people who will respond sometimes to a census will leave children off. We need to know about the children. Um, we have a lot of folks that are homeless here. We still want to count them because they're still getting services through the town of Barnstable. There are folks that are um, on some kind of aid. That information is important to us too. So we want everyone. Whether you're here six or eight months out of the year, or are you here, you know, part time? What what is your what? When are you here, and when are you using these facilities? Right. 
So let's talk a little mm -hmm. bit about some of those demographics. You've touched on the homeless uh, population mm -hmm. uh, here on Cape Cod, but also um, those transient residents who may spend a portion of their year someplace else, or perhaps a college student. How is that handled in the census? You know, that's a good question. The, the college students that do go away to school, they are capturing that information as well at the college level, but the parents are probably keeping that person also on the census because they're only there for a portion of the year and then they're home again. Same is true of those folks that are snowbirds. Where do they consider their home? Do they consider their home here on the Cape or do they consider their home in Florida or the Carolinas or wherever they are? We need to know that. We need to try and capture that information. Right. So what's a, a good rule of thumb, especially for our snowbirds out there, um, of determining where they're living um, at any given time within the year? We ask them to tell us where they, what address do you use for the IRS when you do your tax return? Okay. Because that's the address then that we would consider your full-time address. Right. So we've touched upon our homeless populations and uh, school-aged children and college students. What other populations seem to be undercounted? Well, we have an awful lot of immigrants on the Cape, and they're out there working. They're a part of a viable part of our community, and they need to know that this information is just for census purposes. It doesn't go anyplace else. It is a matter of fact, the census that is gained, the information that's gained on a personal level is just all put together in a big pot so that we can look at the demographics and we, we're not looking at any one individual. Um, in 72 years, that information will be made available so those folks that are out there doing um, genealogy, they can find this information out about their their parents or their grandparents or whomever. Right. So we want to reiterate that all of the census, all the questions that are on there are held in the highest confidentiality. Um, none of this uh, information is made public in any way until after 72 years? Absolutely. And the people that do the census are, are um, have to sign a confidentiality ac agreement they realize they could be prosecuted and, and uh, they just, they keep that information very, very safe. Right. So <coughs> now we're at the census. There's a, a full timeline of this. So let's really delineate for our residents when they can expect to be contacted about the census. The first mailing should go out about mid-March. Okay. <coughs> it's gonna be a letter form, I believe, uh, to all the people in the town of Barnstable, or actually everywhere in the United States. It's supposed to be a concerted effort all the way across the United States. Um, the address that we have for your voter registration information, that's the address they're going to use. So we're hoping that everyone's address for mailing is up to date. Um, beyond that, if you don't respond, and you can respond in more than one way, if you don't respond, then you're going to get a postcard in two weeks. And then after that, if you don't respond, you're going to get one more mailing. And if they don't hear back from you at the Census Bureau, they're going to send someone out to see you. So let's just back <coughs> up a little bit. Um, the census itself can be in three different uh, formats. So mm -hmm. I believe I heard it was online. Yep. Yay. Uh, paper format mm -hmm. if you love to fill in the bubbles mm -hmm. um, and then the last one was by phone yes <clears throat> because they have 12 different languages being spoken by phone so that someone who doesn't understand the the English language they can actually make a phone call and talk to someone who can speak Portuguese or Russian or whatever and help them. Um, we're trying to make sure that everyone understands that no one is going to, on the phone, no one's going to ask you for money, no one's going to ask you social security number, nobody, no one's going to ask you for bank accounts. All we need is the information that will help us to complete the census for 2020. Right, so we can reiterate that 
there's no monetary uh, ask at this. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no discerning information about the person itself. Mm -hmm. There's no social security numbers. There's no, you know, father's last name, mother's last name, any of that information as well. Mm -hmm. This is a very general survey that just looking for information for demographics. Absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> when does the person come to your house and should we expect them at any time of the day? Actually, they can come to your house between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. They will have a, 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 a lanyard with a picture of them and the logo for the census, the census 2020. They'll also have uh, a bag with them that has the census, set, census 2020 on it, and inside the bag will be a laptop. So they could actually sit down with you and do everything on a laptop. But mm -hmm. all of those things will have the census 2020 logo on them. Right. Now, we do have a population that might be a little um, scared of opening that door. Is there a safeguard with that? Can they call somebody if they think that maybe they, they don't have a census person in their, their home? Absolutely. The, the person standing outside your house can give you a telephone number to call to speak to their particular supervisor. There's also numbers uh, that will be online that you can call to the centralized information for Census Bureau, and they will give you the information. So there's a bunch of different ways, and they have to all be uh, vetted with the police department. So every, you know, it's it's a safeguard all the way around. It's a safeguard all the way around. So. One, you'll get information about when the census is open and mm -hmm. how to um, take either the phone, the paper, or the online version of mm -hmm. the census. Uh, if you don't fill out that or didn't get one, mm -hmm. it's probably because your address hasn't been updated. Mm -hmm. What is the single <coughs> most important thing that you want residents to remember about Census 2020? It's so important for everyone to be counted. It's just so important, and it falls on everything that we have here in this beautiful community that we live in. We're, we're so fortunate to be here, um, but we need to make sure that we're getting everything that we possibly can for the life that everybody wants to lead here. Census 2020, be counted. How will 2020 census data be used? Where there are more people, there are more needs for public services. That's why the census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Let's be honest. We do a lot of dumb things with pens. But a really smart thing you can do is fill out your census form. An accurate headcount means Washington will give us the money we need for schools, roads, and improving public transportation. So do something smart with a pen. Fill out your confidential census form or do it online and help get the money our communities deserve. How do I take the 2020 census? In March 2020, every address in the country will receive an invitation to complete a simple questionnaire. And there are three ways to respond. Number one, do it online. Number two, call by phone. Number three, send it by mail. For those who don't respond, a census taker from your community will follow up and assist you. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov.